<clears throat> well, I have been asked to talk about pick up from really the, the words of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, at that uh, wonderful last Mass at which some of us were privileged to be. You remember the theme of the World Youth Day was go and make disciples of all nations from the end of Matthew's Gospel. And the Holy Father took that text and this is how he began his homily at that Mass. Go and make disciples of all nations. With these words, Jesus is speaking to each one of us, saying, it was wonderful to take part in World Youth Day, to live the faith together with young people from the four corners of the earth. But now you must go. You must pass on this experience to others. Jesus is calling you to be a disciple with a mission. Today, in the light of the word of God that we have heard, what is the Lord saying to us? What is the Lord saying to us? Three simple ideas. Go, do not be afraid, and serve. Okay, so it's that, those three words, ideas of the Holy Father that I would like to follow up on because now we're all home, those of us who were there or those of us who went to Scotland, Rio, we are back, we are back to ordinary life. Winter is coming, the days get shorter, our spirits droop a little perhaps. Go, do not be afraid and serve. Now the punch in those, in those three is the last, to serve, to serve. Because go, well go, I mean, wh where do I go? If someone says go, well, <coughs> well where? They might just need to clear off, go away. Uh, but go and serve. And then do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to do what? To serve. So it's serve is the idea. Now what a wonderful thing Christ our Lord has brought us uh, here in this whole reality idea of service. What a joy, even amid difficulties, that brings to our lives. Christ is saying to us, don't, you know, not to lord it over others, not to oppress other people, not to dominate them, not to get the better of them, not to live an enclosed, self-centered life, but to serve, but to serve. That is what we are called to do. Now, first question, who do we serve? Who do we serve? Well, in the first place, naturally, God, the Lord. And what a wonderful thing it is for a human being uh, to be able to say of his or herself, I am a servant of the Lord. And what a wonderful ancestry we have if that's what, what we try to, to be. Abraham was a servant of the Lord, the Bible says. So was Moses, Joshua, David, King Hezekiah, Zerubbabel, so were the prophets, so were the whole people of Israel. Israel as a whole was the servant of the Lord in the midst of all the other nations, called, consecrated and sent. What did Mary say when the angel came to her and invited her to become the mother of the Messiah by the power of the Holy Spirit? Look. I am the servant of the Lord. And what did Paul call himself, the great Paul? A servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, a servant of God. 
And what did Jesus say about himself? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And another time, which is the greater, the one who sits at table or the one who serves? Of course, it's the one who's sitting at the table. But I am among you as one who serves. And then what was the most beautiful expression, uh, symbolic expression that G Jesus gave to that in his life? Well, we think, don't we, of the Last Supper when he washed the disciples' feet. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Behold my servant, in whom I shall be glorified. It's a line in the book of Isaiah. But it is really God the Father speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God and the servant of the Lord. He's God and he's man. And the more like Jesus we are, the more uh, the, the water of baptism, the grace of baptism is flowing in us, then the more we will be filled with the spirit of service. The more the grace of the Holy Eucharist is feeding us, the more we, our, our whole being will be propelled in the direction of service. Who do we serve? Okay, well, God first of all, yes. But in the Lord and for the Lord, of course, we serve one another. You were called to freedom, brothers, says St. Paul, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, for self-indulgence, but through love be servants of one another. Now, funnily enough, in the, you know how there's the divine office and there's, in that there's an office of readings each day. And today, there's, the second reading there was from one of the early church fathers called Gregory of Nyssa. And he says, the servants, this is a beautiful line, the servants of Christ are redeemed, which means liberated, for service of the brethren. The servants of Christ, that's what we become by faith and baptism. We are freed by Christ, like um, what Daniel was talking about, the girl who freed from drugs by turning to Christ. But what are we freed for? Uh, not just to say hallelujah, but to serve the brethren, to serve others, to serve one another. We are set free in order to serve. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, said Jesus, and whoever would be first among you must be your servant. So, right. We're trying to explore this notion of service. That's just a little bit of the biblical background of it. And who do we serve? Go and serve. So that means go beyond yourself. Go outside yourself. It means make a free gift of yourself, of your life. It means recognize the gift that God has given you and use it to glorify him and to bring joy to others, to serve uh, means to live a life that is centered on Christ and it is fulfilled in the church, it's centered on God, it's centered on other people. So, now here's another thing. Go and serve. The Pope, this is another thing the Pope mentioned in his homily. Go, it doesn't mean go it alone. It doesn't mean go by yourself. It means go with others, go with others. Uh, we, we, we are all, okay, yes, you go to Brazil and you realize how easy it is to enter into relationships with other people because they're so open and warm and friendly. Whereas here you have to kind of chip through the ice, as it were, to get to the human being underneath sometimes, it may take time. Uh, but. Uh, we, we live in, in a whole series of relationships, don't we? But um, 
to, to serve the, 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 the larger circle in a way in which we find ourselves of humanity as a whole but is the church and to serve means that is means to take our part in the mission of the church as a whole now each of us is unique and irreplaceable each of us there is one work that only I or you, he or she can do. As Cardinal Newman famously said, I am as necessary in my place as an archangel is in his. There is something to bring creation to its perfection, to participate in the work of Christ, to be a, a living member of his, of his body. There is something that I alone can do but I do it with others I do it with others uh, you'll have heard of the great German conductor Herbert von Karajan and he said uh, what he was asked once what do you look for for people in your orchestra who are going to play in your orchestra the Berlin Philharmonic or whatever what do you look for in these musicians he said that they have the music inside themselves and that they can play in time with others. Those are the two things. To have the music in yourself but to be able to play in time with others. To be part, and we are called to play God's music in the world. That's what did the church is to be Christ is the cantor of the universe Christ is the great singer of the universe and the church sings with him and uh, uh, and this music well this music not just sing okay we've got to say that kind of music an orchestra you've got to get the orchestra in it and each of us somebody's got an oboe somebody's got a flute somebody's got a guitar and all of this but we are playing in an orchestra there it is so and then again uh, so yeah, the parish. This is where the parish comes in because when it becomes concrete, usually the usual way in which we live our belonging to the church is in a parish. Or we may find some other group to which we belong or some form of association with a religious community or a prayer group or whatever. But that's the first thing is go, go and serve means go outside yourself to God and to others and then it means to serve with others and then the Pope says don't be afraid don't be afraid now why would we be afraid well I suppose because we might lack self-confidence or we feel we have nothing to offer and then uh, that can develop because actually, if you do follow Christ, and I mean, Christ could not, could not have been clearer about this in the Gospel, uh, you've got to expect trouble. You're going to be criticised, probably. The one thing probably we most fear is being ridiculed, don't you think? Being laughed at. Um, that's something we are very frightened of very frightened of being laughed at making a fool of ourselves and Christ says well yeah you won't just be laughed at people will actually hate you and so to serve is to suffer there's no possibility of serving that does not entail suffering and we can be frightened by that when John Paul II you remember in 1981 on the 13th of May he was shot in St Peter's Square For, by the grace of God and the prayers of Our Lady he wasn't killed but he was seriously wounded and, it, and he, fell, he fell to the floor of the Pope Mobile and he said I mean only, only John Paul would say, would say this most people would say ouch or something and he said this validates my ministry <laughs> this validates my service because uh, I, I, I have suffered 
there. Now, the, how do we overcome this fear of suffering? The only way is, and Pope Francis said this, is that because Christ is with us. Christ is by our side, and Christ doesn't let us down. So there we are. Now, that's just a little bit of background, but now I want to come, because as I said at the beginning, you know, we go, we, you know, World Youth Day, it is a great experience. It is a life-changing experience. It can be that. It's very true. People can be deeply affected. And then we can have other life-changing experiences, just going on a good retreat or just uh, even a, like a, a, a friendship or a moment in prayer or reading scripture, anything. These things can change us. But then we, we can come back to our ordinary life. We're back in the world. We're back in a parish or whatever. We're back trying to do our job, our work. What, how can this... Uh, great whoosh um injection of uh, energy and grace that we have received how can that not fizzle out you know how can it not be like one of the plastic cups that catches fire and you just have to drop it on the floor and that's the end of it how can we keep the light burning daily life well now sister christiana you've got to blame her for the rest of this but she made i think it's a good idea she said it would be good uh, to, to hear from from a, a bishop the how he see a bit how he sees the diocese and what in the diocese what what opportunities there are for service for service what opportunities there are now first of all I just want to you know we don't unless you're a bishop you don't really you know wake up first thing in the morning thinking about the diocese or you know it's not your last thought at night before you fall asleep uh, I realize that but um, let me just say a word about it the, the, this particular diocese in which we are either permanently or temporarily but this diocese is actually the largest in Western Europe outside Scandinavia physically geographically and it's the only diocese in the United Kingdom that goes from uh, the, Atlant uh, the, the, the Atlantic to the North Sea that goes across the whole country and it actually embraces one third of Scotland so it is very large physically and geographically but small in the number of Catholics small and small perhaps in its number of parishes it has 43 parishes scattered throughout all this area now you know some dioceses have 200 parishes 300 parishes and all of that now the word diocese it's always good to look at where do words come from you can get a word uh, it, it's a, a word that's come to us through Latin from Greek and hidden in the middle of the word diocese is the Greek word for a house, oikos, or a household. And funnily enough, the same goes for the word uh, for a parish. Um, that's a kind of longer story, but also in the middle of the word parish is the word house. So a diocese is actually a house or a household, a house of God, a temple. You remember St. Paul talking of the church says this, the, the church is a holy temple. We, the members of the church, we are a holy temple in the Lord. And in the Lord, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. We are to be a community of people, of believers, in whom God is living by the Spirit. And everything else, all the organization, and bishops and priests and deacons and religious sisters and all of this is, is ordered to, subordinate to, is there to bring, help bring about this reality, this temple of the Lord in this place. Now, it's a house built by God. It's a house 
because only God, unless the Lord build the house, he labours in vain who builds it. But we can work with God to build this house. This house. We can cooperate with him. And over the years, how many people before us have, why is this church here? Why is this convent here? None of us have, have done anything to it. You know, sister put on with a moth or something, and tied it up a bit and hung up a nice few pictures. But it was here before they came. Uh, it was here before, uh, you know, before I came as well. And, uh, and so it is throughout, so, so it is through everywhere. We are, we are living on the shoulders of other people. On, on thanks to their work. But now, we are alive. We have one life. What will we do? What will we pass on to the next generation? What will people in a hundred years look back and say about us? What did we do to help build the house of God in this place? There's a question for each of us, because each of us has a role to play. A diocese is a group of Christians united around their bishop and priests. With, and yeah, here's a further point. This, this temple, you remember how our Lord says of the temple that my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. For all nations. And, well, our own diocese has many nations represented in it, which is uh, very good. But we are not just here to be what they call a holy huddle, right? We are, we are a diocese that the Christians who live in a particular place, united by their faith, united through the celebration of the same sacraments and united with their bishop and the priest and the bishop is in communion with the bishop of Rome so we're in communion with the church throughout the world all of that we are sent to the people among whom we live we live we are on a mission because the church is by nature missionary so the question is how can each of us individually and together serve in this place, in the diocese, how can we help build the house of God? How can we share the mission of the church in this place? Now, I want to suggest, sorry, you probably thought about time I finished, but actually I'm only just beginning now. Uh, I've got seven ways seven ways and I will ask you at the end to give them back to me just to make sure I haven't wasted my time or yours uh, right how do we let, right number one now this is it the first is very down to earth it's just through our ordinary life and work now, it is a famous temptation, you might say, in the spiritual life. We meet God. Our lives are changed. And uh, we discover prayer. We discover the joy of being with God. And that is very good. And it's right that that should be, as it were, indulged. Uh, but we mustn't stop there. Well, we mustn't overlook. Ordinary life can then seem rather drab and uninteresting. And it's much more exciting to go off to events and uh, have your heart moved by music and to pray and to testify and all of this. But we mustn't think that serving God and the church means just doing holy or churchy things. It doesn't. It's for our whole life. And if you're a lay person, then most certainly it doesn't mean that. Now, it's the teaching of the, the Second Vatican Council and of Blessed John Paul II in Christi Fidelis Laici that the specific vocation, if you are a lay person, your specific vocation 
is to sanctify, to Christianize, which also means to humanize, ordinary life. Life in the world. In other words, when raising a family, you do, and or doing a job. Doing those things in a Christian way enlightened by faith. So actually, if you're going to ask the question, what does the diocese most need? What does the church in this, in this place, in the north of Scotland, most need? It most needs the beauty of a married life according to the mind of Christ. That's what it most it, it needs. Christian marriage, Christian families, Christian couples. The domestic church, it's called, the church in the home. Just to be a husband or a wife, a mother or a father, in a Christian and Catholic way, is it's a service to the whole of humanity, actually. That sounds pretty melodramatic, but it's, act, it's true. It goes beyond yourselves. John Paul II used to say, the future of humanity passes by way of the family. In my own life, the sort of implosion of family life is, I think, one of the, the biggest changes that's happened. It is the security in family life when I was young that that just often isn't now. But there you are. Now, and what does the church in this place most need secondly is, is we're still on point one, so, is Christians, true unashamed Christians in the world of work. In the world of work. Now, thanks to Christianity, our society is actually deeply imbued with the idea and ideal of service. I mean, you, you see this word service everywhere. Coming along in the bus, comes along and says, sorry, not in service. Bus isn't in service. Um, but as Christians, we're talking about service. The first service is married life, family life. Another service is that we live our own work, we do our own work, whatever it may be, as long as it's honest and honourable, uh, precisely as a service. In other words, so we don't just think of, you know, the, say the company for which I work, may it make lots of money and so on, but we think for the people that our company or our profession is meant to serve. Now that's more obvious in some fields of work than others. But we talk of military service or the armed services. And the military people, it's actually a very noble way of life. As long as the causes in which you fight are just. But a soldier is a servant of the defence of his country and the maintenance of peace. But think of nursing and the whole medical profession. What a service. Think of teaching. Or again, we speak of the civil service. And being a civil servant, we speak of the fire service. People who work in shops or restaurants or hotels and pubs are there to serve their customers. That's what they say. Anyway, that's the patter, as it were. Now, often these are just platitudes and lip service. But it's our job as Christians to make it real, not just words. It's to keep that focus on others, to be respectful of every other human being always to be human in our dealings with others, not to become just an official, just a bureaucrat, or whatever. Always to treat other people as an end and not as a means. Well, now, uh, it was interesting, some of you, when you're talking about Rio, saying, yes, it was wonderful to meet all these people and the, op the openness and so on. Now, Pope Francis used the phrase, speaking to the bishops and priests in Rio, of a culture of encounter. A culture of encounter. It's a good phrase. Uh, and, and so when you meet another person, it really is, it, it's not purely functional, not purely administrative, not purely practical. It's a real meeting between two people. And I think that's a major element in witnessing to our faith in the workplace. So there are many others. But Pope Francis says, says uh, often to all of us, we must... We mustn't be inward looking, we must go out, we must go to the edges of society. 
Now those edges are in many ways, in our world, the secular professions. The secular professions in which many of you would be working. The secular workplace. Those are the edges, really, from our point of view. And we need to go into those with the Christian spirit of service. Okay. Sorry, that's only number one. The others will be shorter. Okay. Now, but that's very, very important, <laughs> what, what I've been trying to say there. That, that it, it's not... To, 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 to go, go, be afraid, and do not serve. Uh, sorry. Go, go, do not be afraid, and serve. Uh, do, <laughs> sorry, not in service. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is, not, <laughs> is not about holy churchy things. It's about your whole life. It's about your family life. It's about your work life. Please take that on board. Big time. Because we really need that. This Christian peasant in the world. We really need that. It's a temptation to Christianity at this present time just to, to lock itself up. Now, let me turn now to forms of service within the church. Now, here's one that's very humble but very real. I mentioned in our diocese we have 43 parishes okay? but we don't have 43 parish priests uh, and many priests have to look after two or more parishes so the parish priest here for example is actually looking after seven churches and three parishes. Uh, one man trying to do that with the help of a deacon and involved in that are many, obviously, very practical administrative things which require a priest's attention and often keep him from his more essential tasks of preaching the gospel, celebrating the sacraments, and caring for souls. Now, in the old days, almost every priest had a housekeeper. A housekeeper would be a lady who, li who lived in the house and who did the cooking, uh, did the laundry, uh, kept the house clean, answered the telephone, answered the door. Now, nowadays, that's, that's a thing of the past. Doesn't happen. Uh, but every priest needs help, practical help. Some less, some more, and some very much. <laughs> uh, not perhaps with cooking, because what with supermarkets and microwaves and ready meals and so on, you can more or less get through life. Uh, without a professional cook but for example the parish's finances uh, the fabric of the churches and the other properties computers, websites his car, plumbing joinery work all these things which can take up an awful lot of a priest time and some of them like doing that and that's fine but if you have a skill in any of these areas why not offer it if, if if, you know, we're talking about coming back, as it were, from a high, uh, coming down the mountain of transfiguration to the plain again, what are we going to do? Let's do something. You know, don't just emote. Emotions are for the sake of motion. Emotions are to move us to do things. And the thing we are called to do is to serve. But if you have a skill then, why not offer it in this way? You know, if, you can, if you're good with figures, you can do accountancy or whatever. Uh, but there are a few greater blessings for a priest than a discreet, effective, dependable helpers of this kind. Maybe occasional, maybe on a regular basis. But it's a real, humble, simple, practical thing, a background service of the church and her mission. Okay. Uh, number three. Now, we know how important the life of the parish and the life of the church is the celebration of the liturgy. And here's another great field of voluntary service in which some of you I know are already uh, heavily engaged. But there are so many roles here. You know, we go to Mass. So you just go along to Mass and the other priest turns up and says Mass. But there's an awful lot behind that. There's an awful lot before that and after that of practical stuff. Um, 
the, you, the, you know, you need a sacristan, somebody looks after the sacristan. What about altar servers, readers, people who are going to help with the children's liturgy if you have one, organists, musicians, singers, choir members, pass keepers, cleaners, too. All those, that, you know, there's a whole realm, again, this is pretty humble stuff, but it's rather beautiful. You, we know the second Eucharistic prayer. We're giving thanks that you have held us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Stand in your presence and serve you. We give you thanks. It's just such a privilege to come before God in the liturgy and stand in your presence and serve you. Well, that applies to the priest. That applies to, to the people who are praying there. But it applies also to the people who are helping this liturgy happen in a beautiful and dignified and prayerful way. We have a very fine uh, master of ceremonies in this, in this diocese who mainly at the cathedral and uh, Mr. George Brand and that, those words are, are, are the inspiration of his life he loves those words from the second Eucharistic prayer that you have held us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you serve you you see there you are the magic word it's what the angels do the angels are serving God in the liturgy in heaven and we can serve God in the liturgy on earth fourthly faith formation now this we think uh, especially perhaps of children and young people but not just there's a service to be done helping prepare for example children for first confession holy communion confirmation there's a need uh, for catholic teachers in our in the primary schools we have in the diocese there's a need for catechists in the parishes both for children and then for adults who want to, come, want to become Catholics or are coming back to the faith. There's also the business of preparing couples for marriage. I, I mean, I know one priest uh, not far from here who, who said, you know, could, would, be, would there be some people who would um, help prepare couples for marriage? Nobody comes forward. Nobody comes forward. And this, this is what often the, the priests say, they, they invite the volunteers, nobody comes forward because they're afraid often they're afraid or they don't feel they know enough or whatever but that can be overcome I was at a meeting the other night we have, uh, I helped look after a little French community in, in Aberdeen and because the people there change every three years because they work for the big oil companies always having to find uh, new, new catechists for the children and so on and again about it's hard work finding, finding people who are, feel qualified enough uh, to do that but thinking of Christian marriage you know marriage, marriage has never been easy and it doesn't have the social support it once did and Christian marriage it, it has, it's full of the grace of the sacrament but it has its own demands and, but lay help there is very very precious there's a, there's a little body I think some people in the diocese are part of it called Teams of Our Lady um, the French thing originally it was Notre Dame I think and they, that it's a way of helping married people in their, in their Christian life ok so that's another area of faith formation fifthly now what about charity or reaching out to those in need now every parish can do something there and there are many initiatives not necessarily Catholic or Christian trying to alleviate one or other suffering and we can join in those and some of them are wonderful but what, what is there of Catholic work uh, for people who are in particular need well at the national level I mean you, you, you will I'm sure heard of the Scottish Catholic International Aid Fund SCIAF that has local representatives as well and it needs local representatives there's Mary's, there's Mary's Meals there's the Society of St Vincent de Paul that's a great international lay society which helps the, the poor to use that phrase it has three quarters of a million members throughout the world and in this diocese I think it has about ten different conferences there are some in 
in, in parishes. Uh, the unborn are a very vulnerable part of our society, as we know. And there are bodies like the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child and others dedicated to them and to the care of women uh, who have had abortions. And also, uh, I mentioned you know, the, the Atlantic and the North Sea, uh, where a diocese with a, huge co with a huge coastline and with some pretty major ports, uh, notably Aberdeen and then Lerwick in, in uh, Shetland is quite a big port, and Kirkwall to some extent, and Peterhead, and one or two others. And you've got lots of, of boats uh, coming in. And there's something called the Apostleship of the Sea. I don't know if you've heard of that. Apostleship of the Sea, which, which, uh, which is sort of Catholic outreach to seafarers. Uh, and because Aberdeen is an important place for that, there is a, a man who's their representative in Aberdeen. And they need volunteers. They run a, there's a center down by the harbor which they run. And they're, they're welcome to have to, to have people go down there just for a couple of hours to be there. Um, because a lot of seafarers are actually Catholics. A lot of, Fili a lot of them are Filipinos and, and so on. And a lot of them, there's a lot of uh, uh, human rights abuses that happen in that, that world. Uh, there's also a hope that Chanakulo, I don't know if any of you have heard of Chanakulo, which is a, um, a, a wonderful way started by an Italian nun some while ago. Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. well it helps those addicted to drink or drugs find a new life um, and it helps them in, in a very uh, remarkable way um, a kind of spiritual and Christian way and we hope that they, that they would like to find a house in this diocese and open up a place there's only one in the UK which is down in uh, Kendall in, the, in Lancashire. But I wish there was more. But, and, and I know that people individually support charities and, or, or, they, and, or have links abroad and go out and do uh, that wonderful lady, Rachel, at the cathedral, who some of you know, she goes out to Uganda every so often uh, as a dentist and so on. But wouldn't it be, a, wouldn't it be great if, if a group of, of you uh, got together and chose one area of human need, especially in a place like Aberdeen, and tried to meet it. Um, specifically in the name of the church, or specifically as Catholics. That would be great, wouldn't it? Okay, sixthly, we're getting near the end, and lunch. Um, the greatest charity we can show to someone else, of course, is to share our faith and hope in God with them, isn't it? What is the most, surely, Christ and the faith is the most precious thing in our own life. Um, and do we not wish to share that? And there's another service. The technical word is evangelization. Go make disciples of all nations. That was the theme of the youth day. And this is what Pope Francis said there. Go and make disciples of all nations, sharing the experience of faith, bearing witness to the faith, proclaiming the gospel. This is a command that the Lord entrusts to the whole church, and that includes you. But it is a command that is born not from a desire for domination, from the desire for power, but from the force of love from the fact that Jesus first came into our midst and didn't just give us a part of himself, he gave us the whole of himself. He gave his life in order to save us and to show us the love and mercy of God. Jesus does not treat us as slaves, but as people who are free, as friends, as brothers and sisters. And he not only sends us, he accompanies us, he is always beside us in our mission of love. Where does Jesus send us? There are no borders, no limits. He sends us to everyone. The gospel is for everyone, not just for some. It is not only for those who seem closer to us, more receptive 
more welcoming. It is for everyone. Do not be afraid to go and bring Christ into every area of life, to the fringes of society, even those who seem farthest away, most indifferent. The Lord seeks all. He wants everyone to feel the warmth of his mercy and his love. Well, perhaps some of us have some way to go here. And you know, um, I, th I think quite a lot of consciousness raising is needed on this point of evangelization. Um, because in Scotland and, and the United Kingdom, we have long belonged to a rather vulnerable minority. Uh, and so we have kept a low profile. And we've done our best to make ourselves respected and respectable. Uh, we've been middle class, actually. But the danger is that we always keep our head below the parapet. Or we think of our religion, our faith, as something to help us, or to help me through life, sort out my problems, uh, and get me to heaven and not as a gift to be shared. We don't go. Uh, perhaps we're not filled enough with the joy of our faith, or perhaps we're not in love enough with Christ. Perhaps that flame has burnt a bit low. So what can we do? What can we do? The Emmanuel community, which is one of the, the new communities, is, I think one person, now, now two, two people I think in Aberdeen who belong to it, they run schools of mission. They have them in a few cities in the world where you can go for a year, live an intensive Christian life and be formed as an evangelist. And I think there are more things going on in England uh, than there are in Scotland in this, in this way. Uh, there's also something called Night Fever, which I believe Father Keith is going to introduce in the cathedral, which is um, a good idea. And there's also, this is a slightly different thing, and if any of you are interested in this, I'd be, I'd be pleased to hear. Uh, th there was some, it was an initiative that was started uh, in England at the time of the Pope's visit, Pope Benedict's visit in 2010. And before the, the Pope came, then, there was a, a massive hostility in the media towards Pope Benedict. It was terrible. And so a group of Catholic lay people uh, in, in down south said, look, we, we need uh, to um, be available and trained to present a positive picture of the church <coughs> in the media. And so they set up a thing called Catholic Voices. Uh, and, the, and in fact, they did very well. They, 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 there was this group, they were trained, they learned how to do interviews, all this kind of thing, how to appear on the television, how to make a statement, how when you're asked a, one of these crazy questions, not to get annoyed, but to turn it round and make it, make the point that you want to make, all that kind of thing. Uh, and they did very well. And, and so, in fact, uh, the, the, the media's perception of Pope Benedict, I mean, this was largely through Pope Benedict himself, but still these other people helped, changed completely. And the whole thing became positive. But there are so many uh, controversial issues at the moment, or so many issues where we get, we, we only ever hear uh, the anti Catholic position, really, that, and that's just put out there again and again and again. And these are what we need, instead of poor old bishops standing up who don't know how to do it and nobody's going to listen to anyway, we want lay people who are trained and qualified and are ready to put their heads above the parapet and put them, write letters to newspapers or make themselves known to the local, you know, local newspapers, local radio stations, local television or whatever, or even national television, and be available. Put their names out, as it were, that I'm ready to speak. If you want someone to talk about a Catholic thing, I'm ready to do it. And they offer a training. And 
I would like to get a group in this diocese of lay, uh, enough lay people, I've got some already, who would be interested because we can invite these people up. They do a three-day training. It doesn't cost nothing. So the more people you have, the better because that shares the cost. Um, so if any of you would be interested in that, uh, you, 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 you might let me know. Uh, and then I'll do that. Sorry, I'm going on too long, but um, I, I'm nearly there. Now, I began with the idea of the specifically lay service of living as a Christian in the family and in the workplace, secular setting usually. But I'll end with the well-known and very precious services of the consecrated life, religious life, and the ordained ministry of deacons and priests. Now, I don't like putting those together because they are distinct, but nonetheless, for simplicity's sake, would do it. Now, only a few, of course, are called to this, but those few are for the many. And both the consecrated life and the ordained ministry are very intimate ways of sharing in the mission of Christ and the church and of serving other people. They are a form of friendship with Christ. They're not jobs. They're a way of, they're, they're a way of life. That's what's beautiful about them. They ask a lot, they ask everything for people, but then they give you everything. They bring you everything. And they're a real way of giving your life in service. It requires sacrifices, most visibly of being a father or a mother, uh, but they have their own fruitfulness and fulfillment and joy. And it, it, the, the beautiful thing about that, uh, the, these ways of life and there are many different forms of religious life, of course, consecrated life, many different forms. But the beautiful thing about them is it is the possibility they offer to you of coming close to the heart of God, the merciful heart of God, and close to the heart of the people whom you serve. Uh, 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 because you meet people, you touch people, people reveal themselves to you at what, at the level that is deepest. Uh, you know, we are all, you know, I don't know if you, there was an interesting interview with, um, I was giving lots of interviews at the moment, but with the Pope, and, and first of all, the, the, this was being done by another Jesuit, and the first question that was put to the Pope was, who, who do you, uh, who are you? Who are you? And the Pope went silent. And then he said, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Now, can anybody tell me what his motto is? Yeah, go on. Very good, yeah. Miserando et eligendo. Now, this, 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 I really will stop, but this is, this is, this is, it's beautiful, it's really beautiful. Miserando et eligendo. That means um, having mercy and choosing. Now, when he was a young man, he in, in Argentina, and he went. He went to confession, and he 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 experienced God's mercy, God's forgiveness of his sins. And at the same moment, he became aware that he, or well, that he was being called by the Lord to be a Jesuit. Miserando, he received the mercy of God, and Eligendo, being chosen. He found his vocation at that moment. And this is it. We have received the mercy of God. But within that mercy, in a way, well, it's amazing uh, what the Lord does, that he then, give, he then asks us to do something. He really 
asks us to do something. It's like Peter, do you love me? And then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Peter, full of sorrow for his betrayal of the Lord at the, the time of the Passion, Jesus says, do you love me? Jesus has mercy on him. That's the forgiveness of Jesus showing his forgiveness there. And then saying, feed my sheep. Now, the phrase, miserando et eligendo, comes from the writings of St. Bede the Venerable, who was an English Benedictine monk and a great commentator on scripture. And he is writing about the story of Jesus' call of Matthew. Matthew the tax collector. Okay. Uh, Miserando et eligendo. You remember the story? Uh, Matthew is sitting at the, he, he's a tax collector, and he's sitting there with his pile of money. Jesus walks past, looks at him, and from a Jewish point of view, he would have been an outcast because he was collaborating with the occupying power and um, dealing with, so, yes, a collaborator. Uh, Jesus looks at him and says, come follow me. Come follow me. And St. Bede, commenting on that, said, Jesus looked at that, miserando et eligendo, having mercy and choosing. Each of us, I think. It's a beautiful motto that the Pope has chosen there. Miserando et eligendo. So, our Lord, we can think, it's a great mercy to have gone to our youth days. It's a great mercy we receive every time we go to confession. It's a great mercy 